We open in Ohio in 1995 on a young girl with blue and red hair riding her bike lazily down a street. Life appears good. She waves to neighbor kids and rides home to a normal house with a normal sister doing normal... Uh, hang on, did they just cut from the sister on the swings to the sister doing her best Bray Wyatt impression? Anyways, they try to out-cute each other and then the younger sister falls down and... something's her knee. Along comes the mother and we can definitely see that the knee didn't get hurt at all. Okay, apparently pain only makes you stronger, but her knee is just dirty. Wipe it off. The little sister calls Fireflies forest stars, which is strange, but whatever, and the mom gives them a speech about why the obviously CGI Fireflies light up. They go inside to have dinner, and who the hell cuts their corn like this? The dad, we'll call him Fake Hellboy, gets home while DuckTales is playing on the TV. You see, this movie is made by Disney, and this scene is set in the 90s. And they want you to know it. Fake Hellboy and the mom sneak around the edge of the dining room wall, and apparently they have like an hour to pack up shit and leave, which makes Blue Hair quite unhappy. Mom makes Blue Hair leave a book behind, Mom asks Fake Hellboy if he has it, and he presents a floppy, which he says is the only copy not on fire. They pile into an SUV, and the mom says they're going home, to which the little sister responds, we just left home. Keep that in mind, it's gonna be important later. There's a police barricade as they're leaving the neighborhood, but they don't get stopped there or even have to go through it, so I wonder what the point of including this shot was. Little Sister demands her song, and fake Hellboy puts on Don McLean's American Pie. Okay, strange choice for a piece of music a kid would like to listen to in the 90s, but whatever. I'd have suggested something from the 80s or 90s, something from Weird Al or Michael Jackson, but hey, I'm a 90s kid and some of my favorite music comes from decades before I was born too. They pass by a football game for some reason and turn into what appears to be an airfield, and oh, the Little Sister her name is Yelena, as in Yelena Belova, the second Black Widow. Okay, we'll call the little sister Baby Widow from now on. The family helps get the plane ready. Fake Hellboy stands around like an idiot before throwing a trailer or a dumpster or something out of the way, despite the fact that it has rollers, and I'm pretty sure he could have just shoved it. <laughs> Take a gander at that CG. Why couldn't you guys have just built a prop that was lighter so the actor could actually throw it? This shot is supposed to convey to us that fake Hellboy has some sort of superpower, obviously, but right now all I'm doing is shaking my head at the bad CG and wondering why the MCU appears to be allergic to practical effects these days. And here's something I just noticed while editing. Fake Hellboy pulls his rifle off of his shoulder to shoot at the people inside this SUV. Then we cut to the interior of the SUV, and we can tell that they're already headed towards a giant pile of tires, which is just there for some reason, and they're making no efforts to go any other way. Then if we go frame by frame through the video, we can tell from the blowback of the glass of the windshield that the bullet goes into the passenger. Also, I'm pretty sure from where the bullet hole appears on the glass, fake Hellboy could not have made this shot. It's... it's angled down. Like, if we go back, we can tell that it's angled down into the vehicle, when, if we go back to him firing, he is angling his rifle up. Not to mention that from that distance, he could not have made a downwards shot from that elevation. What the fuck? Then as we go through this, we can tell that the distance between fake Hellboy and the plane changes between these two shots. And for some reason, despite the fact that he just blew up a shield facility, they only sent one shield van after him. What the fuck? S.H.I.E.L.D. shows up with the acronym of their full name printed on their SUVs, which raises exactly the same questions it did in Captain Marvel when they were supposedly first known as S.H.I.E.L.D. at the end of Iron Man. Fake Hellboy shoots at the SUV a few times and then jumps onto the wing of the plane like he's Captain America and Man Out of Time, which I'm sure is a complete coincidence. A S.H.I.E.L.D. agent shoots the mom and Blue Hair has to take the wheel and fly the plane, which she's capable of doing and knows how to for some reason. Mom walks her through parts of it, sure, but it's still somewhat strange that an 11-year-old knows how to fly a plane, much less is capable of doing so. They take off with fake Hellboy on the wing and escape S.H.I.E.L.D. to land in Cuba sometime later, with fake Hellboy having gotten into the cockpit at some point in between. Fake Hellboy has abandoned all pretense of caring about his family and is begging some guy named General Drakov, an original character created for the movie, keep that in mind, it's gonna be important later, who dresses like a stereotypical Russian mobster to give him a new assignment. We find out that fake Hellboy is the Red Guardian, AKA Alexei Shostakov, Black Widow's ex-husband in the 616 comics. Okay. Quick question, who supervised editing continuity on this movie? Baby Widow just sort of appears in the mom's arms in the camera cuts. Fake Hellboy and Drakov's arms change positions between shots, as well as them changing distance between several shots. Then we have what appears to be fake Hellboy handing Drakov the floppy disk in the background of this shot of blue hair speaking Russian to the mother. Then we cut to a close shot of fake Hellboy giving Drakov the exact same floppy disk he just gave him. Was the editor falling asleep while assembling this scene? 
We find out that the mom's name is Melina, as in Melina Vostokova, aka Iron Maiden, Black Widow villain and member of the Thunderbolts. Keep that in mind, because it will never be important. Fake Hellboy says Iron Maiden is strong and will live through the nondescript gunshot, although given what we'll see her survive later in the movie, one wonders why the gunshot even bothers her in the first place. Baby Widow screams for her daddy because the Cuban soldiers are pushing them around while Iron Maiden gets loaded into a truck. A Cuban soldier grabs Baby Widow, but Blue Hair kicks his arm, steals a gun, and declares, I will kill you all. Uh, what the fuck? Who are you? Who taught an 11-year-old how to fight? Why is an 11-year-old able to hit a grown man with enough force to stun him, and how can she disarm him? Why does she know Russian? Fake Hellboy tells her to give him the gun, and the editor clearly fell asleep again because Blue Hair drops the gun in one shot and is still holding it up in the following one. Blue Hair cries about how she doesn't want to go back there, and you can't take her, she's only six, to which Fake Hellboy responds, you were even younger. Savvy members of the audience will no doubt deduce that, since this is a Black Widow movie and the only character left unnamed is Blue Hair, Blue Hair must be Natasha Romanoff. Likewise, given what we know about Black Widow, we can presume that she's talking about the Red Room. Excuse me, what? We're 12 minutes into the film, and Disney has already pulled a solo on Black Widow. Our title character already knows everything that made them who they were before this prequel section. She can fight, she speaks Russian, she can use a gun, and presumably she's already been through the horrors of the Red Room enough to know that she'd rather kill everyone than subject herself or Baby Widow to that treatment again. And I have to ask, are they also implying that she's already been through the Black Widow program's graduation ceremony and Yelena is about to be sent through it too? Because if that's the case, they are directly contradicting what we saw in the final stages of Natasha's Black Widow training in Age of Ultron, where she was considerably older older than she is in this film. If so, that raises a whole new list of questions about how the fuck these girls managed to go through puberty to become the luscious babes they are later in the timeline, and indeed in this film. Of course, even if that's not the case, the film is about to get a whole lot stupider regardless. Fake Hellboy distracts the widow siblings, and the Russians, or Cubans, the communists drugged them, and he shows the first signs of true regret that maybe he's not doing the right thing. To which I say, you picked a hell of a time to grow a conscience, buddy. Maybe you could have decided to not uproot your family and stay undercover in the middle of nowhere at some point before you burned down a shield facility and shot to the top of America's most wanted terrorists. Also, Red Guardian, yeah, he's a Soviet superhero who started as a supervillain. He's an agent of the USSR, basically their answer to Captain America. Newsflash, Eric Pearson, Jack Schaefer, and Ned Benson. The Cold War ended in 1991 and was winding down for several years prior. Fake Hellboy says he's been on that assignment for three years, but that puts his assignment as starting in 1992, a year after the Cold War ended. The alleged explanation for this is that he was working for Drakov past the point at which the Soviet Union dissolved, but at the same time, that now adds another secret society into the MCU along with Hydra's extended lore from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the Inhumans from AOS and their show, the Hand from the Netflix shows, the Masters of the Mystic Arts and Zealots from Doctor Strange, the Order of the Crane from Iron Fist, Sword from WandaVision, the TVA from Loki, the Eternals from their movie, and whatever other bullshit I've yet to find out about from other shows I've yet to watch and movies yet to be announced. When in doubt, add more secret organizations and individuals manipulating things from the shadows. That's how Heroes did it. That's how the Star Wars sequels did it. So what the fuck, why not let her standards for storytelling slip further? Drakov asks fake Hellboy who Blue Hair is, and he confirms that she's Natasha, which I'm pretty sure had to have been added via ADR. In fact, most of the dialogue between Drakov and fake Hellboy is delivered either during edits or from a large enough distance that you can't really see their lips well enough to tell. Also, why is Natasha's hair blue? Well, they never tell us. The only thing I can think of is that they may be trying to draw lines between this and dyeing her hair for the disguise in Infinity War, but... That is a really weak connection. Cut to the opening credits, set to a slow cover of Nirvana Smells Like Teen Spirit, despite the fact that I'm pretty sure Come As You Are would have been a better fit, but Captain Marvel already used that, so fuck it. Also, wait, 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 wait. There's a guy in this cast named O.T. Fuck Benley. Really? That's a real name? That's a real name someone chose to keep. Okay, whatever. For some reason, instead of separating Baby Widow and Natasha while they were asleep, or for that matter, any of the prisoners, Drakov loaded them into a shipping container with a bunch of other girls where they were allowed to wake up. Drakov has the two separated, but instead of disarming and trying to kill their captors like Natasha was threatening to earlier, Natasha just gives Baby Widow a photograph she took from the family car earlier in the movie. One wonders why this scene even exists at all. Why would they stuff a bunch of prospective Black Widows in a Connex box instead of just keeping them drugged until they reached a Red Room facility? Why give the captives a chance to fight back? Why did Drakov not have them immediately bound and gagged when they were knocked out? Why do we see a bunch of what appear to be teenage girls in the opening montage holding stuffed animals? Why are there a bunch of people dressed like knockoff versions of DC's Deadshot? Why does Drakov say, The Red Room is your home now, to Natasha when they imply that she's already been through the program earlier? Was she just a run-of-the-mill Russian spy before now? Somehow I I doubt it because Agent Carter introduced us to some aspects of the Red Room before, and we found out that most of them are trained from birth. 
Rather than giving us a proper origin movie, or hell, even a few origin scenes, we are instead treated to a tonally inappropriate opening credits montage featuring footage of the Cold War and various aspects of Natasha's life and acts of the Black Widow program. Why is this set to licensed music? Why does it exist at all? Aside from the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, we haven't had opening credit sequences in the MCU since Iron Man 2, and no serious superhero film, least of all a Black Widow movie, should be taking influence from James Gunn. And since you're going to show us the credits at the end of the movie anyways, why did you waste our time on a credits montage instead of actually showing us something that matters in a way that doesn't just flash by before anyone has a chance to know what the fuck is going on? Between the mismatched content of the montage and the rest of the movie, I can't help but think this was put together in post to make the movie shorter and more commercial. And given Disney's propensity for for reshoots and executive meddling, that would certainly explain a lot of the problems this movie has in the first 15 minutes alone. And it only gets worse from here.